Welcome to Oilers Live Podcast, episode 22. I've got as my guest tonight, Sean from theoilnight.ca. Uh, you can find him at The Oil Night on Twitter. And I've got Kelly from Beer League Heroes. You can find him at uh, Beer League Hero uh, on Twitter or beerleagueheroes.com. Thanks, guys, for joining me. Thanks for having me. No worries. Uh, always, uh, always happy to have you guys. I think this is probably uh, third or fourth time uh, you've been on. You're kind of my go-tos, uh, and uh, lots going on despite us having a um, what could be considered maybe a meaningless spring in Oilers hockey land. We're used to that uh, for eleven of the past twelve years, so it's not uh, anything new. But um, you know, I, I'd like to think we've got something to look forward to. Uh, what? Uh, maybe let's start with Sean. Uh, you saw the game tonight. Uh, what did you take away from tonight's game? Um, well, I'm liking the depth that we have moving forward next year. I mean, I, I put out a poll there about Ty Ratty. Do you think Ty Ratty will be on this team next year? And last time I checked, it was like 85% was for Ty Ratty being on the team. Um, and I really like what Aberg's doing with Dreisaitl on the second line, too. Um, you know, those two guys alone, if you if you do put them on the team next year, and I know Aberg's is signed, um, I think, through 2019. Um, yeah. You know, we, we've, we've added a little bit more speed, and you can kind of see it that uh, this team's setting up nicely for next year. We still need a couple more players up front, but for the most part, um, you know, they're, they're starting to, uh, you can kind of, kind of see a future with this with this lineup and uh of course mcdavid is absolutely unbelievable and it's nice to see him finally like i said i tweeted out earlier too is uh the cream rise to the top so i thought it was a good game and, and you know the others played great and you know it, it's too bad we're so so many points behind because it's you know i don't know how many games we've won recently but this this team is really on a roll right now so yeah i thought it was good yeah. game. And this is our uh is this our fourth in a row, guys? Or third in a row? Third. Third in a row. Yeah. yeah fourth in the last five, I think. Yeah, fourth in the last five. I know we went three and one on the road trip. Uh, so, um, yeah, this will be our uh, our third in a row. Yep. Seven, two, and one in the last ten. Uh, a little bit too late to be picking it up, but uh, still nice. And uh, uh, before uh, those of you out in uh you know, podcast world that are listening say, I can't believe he missed it. Uh, let's just say Connor McDavid is now leading the Art Ross race. Uh, so that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> Your thoughts on the game tonight, Kelly? Oh, no, I thought they, I thought they played really well despite like their opposition because LA was really pushing that entire match. I, I think I was, I was sitting on the, the edge of my seat, just kind of like waiting you know, for LA to put in that like the shitty bad bounce goal, you know, like the point shot that goes off of four ankles and, and gets in behind Talbot. But they uh, they were really resilient tonight, which reminded me of of last year's squad. So that was that was a uh, you know a positive, you know, given for the way the season is going. Um, I think at this point. You know, McDavid's unstoppable, and he really reminds me of like when when I used to watch, or like when we used to watch Lemieux, when when he was in kind of like that zone too. Where every time he touched the puck in the other zone, it would he'd be in the back of the net. You know, I don't think teams have an answer for for McDavid right now, and he's he's really he's he's getting to another level. And uh, you know, the like like Sean talked about the uh, the depth and whatnot. Aborg is really picking it up since he uh, since he got sat for those couple games, and you're really starting to see him get into a comfort zone with his speed and his his playmaking and puck handling. Um, I think for next season, I don't well, I don't think Kajula should be up in the top six. I think he's a really nice bottom six complementary player because he's he's a little buzzsaw out there, and um, I just think Drysaddle needs an older player. On the on the left wing, not named Milan Lucic. Um, the 
the third line struggled tonight uh, for whatever reason. They were they were on a good goal for the last uh, for the last few games, uh, but tonight I didn't feel like it was one of their best nights. And uh, the fourth line, I I didn't feel like we saw a lot of them tonight. But um, I guess I guess they fared, fared okay. Yeah, I, you know they played uh, pretty limited minutes. I'd say tonight fourth line Kara. I you know I might have seen him hold the puck once or twice even. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, you know, Larson had a a beast of a game tonight. That guy was was key to that to that win this evening, and uh, and Ethan Bear, you know, he didn't uh, he didn't have a a poor game either. He uh, he was on the ice for a lot of the times when Kolpatar was on the ice, and and you know s- seemed to do okay. Um, I hope he's not on the team starting next season. Um, I'm hoping that there were others do a little better with their summer acquisitions so that he can spend another maybe like 50 games down in the minors just to get him rounding out his game a little more he could use uh his skating could use some work i think so what do you guys think uh you mentioned it on twitter um kelly but this was uh and i noticed it too uh lucic out there in the dying minute uh you know, what's your thought on that? Is this, uh, you know, I think that uh, if you're going to give anybody rewards um, for, you know, having a good game, you do that uh, for a guy like Lucic. He probably needs it. I thought he had a good game tonight, probably deserved the last uh, 30, 45 seconds. Although I will say when I saw him out there, I was a little bit scared. Yeah, he, uh, when McClellan has put him out at the end of the game there and the previous couple of times he hasn't fared too well um but i was a little shocked to see him <laughs> you know manny he his defenseman was a dowdy i think on that uh at the end of the game there and uh i don't like that matchup one bit i would have rather had like uh who, who was on the ice at the end it was a uh, it would have been Strom and Lucic. Was Kyra? Was Kyra on the ice? Uh, I'm not sure who the third forward was. It was definitely Strom and Lucic. Um, you know, obviously uh, Connor and and um, Nuge were out uh, the shift right before that. So that's right. Um, Maybe Drysaddle was out there. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. So I'd, I'd have to take. I'd have to go back and take a closer look. But I'm. If I'm the coach, I'm not putting Lucic out there in any like key moments like that. He can, he's got a permanent place on the third line, in my opinion. Like this season's lost for him, and he seems to be gaining a little bit of confidence on that on that third line with Strom and uh, Puliyarvi. So just leave him there and just give him those limited minutes and uh, tell him to do what he can in the time that he has. And uh, definitely don't put him on at the end of the game. Your thoughts on that, Sean? <laughs> Yeah, I pretty much agree. Um, I think it was, I know uh, Nurse and Larson were out there. I'm not sure who the other forward was, but um, yeah, when I saw Lucic out there, <laughs> I got to admit, I was yelling, why is Lucic out there? But um, it, was, it was nice of the coach, I guess, to put him out. Realistically, the games don't really matter. And he wants to give his veteran a vote of confidence, I guess, you know, whatever, against an old team. So I didn't really have, uh, I don't really think it's that big of a deal, to be honest. Yeah, and it's not if he didn't, uh, if he doesn't uh, screw it up, right? Yeah. Um, which he didn't. So I guess that's good. You know what, guys? I, one of the things I noticed tonight, um, you know, we're watching the game, and I actually heard the the fans in the background. So we haven't heard a lot of that this year, uh, and uh, in the fans, as as you know, anybody who's been to a game knows. Uh, they really feed off of the team, how the team's playing. What I thought about midway through the second period when I could hear the fans cheering, let's go Oilers, um, you know, I thought that was kind of a reward for actually showing some desire out there. Like this team tonight, I noticed, uh, and, and you know, over this last stretch, they've, They've really kind of, I, th- I think, come together. But um, the, they, they looked tonight like they really wanted to win. Uh, and I think they're rallying behind um, 
Connor as well, trying to get him that uh, Art Ross for sure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but I but that was one thing I noticed tonight. This was a um, this was in my mind one of the closer efforts we've seen. Even though I'd say in the third period the LA Kings kind of dominated the play most of it, but the Oilers I thought did what they needed to do. Um, but this was one of the closest efforts we've had all season to what I would say is last year's team. Yeah, that's fair. So, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. So anyway, I mean, just taking some positives out of the um, out of the game. Uh, Connor McDavid's obviously now a point ahead of the Art Ross in the Art Ross lead. Um, you know, to your point, Kelly, he does look unstoppable. Uh, Sean, do you think? Um, just get your opinion. Do you think he's uh, now from here on everybody's going to be? Uh, just looking at him up in the lead or, or do you think there's uh, still too much to play to, <laughs> to say, I mean, I mean, in my mind, I look at this as, you know, similar to what Kelly said. I mean, this is kind of like um, Connor just kind of saying I'm the guy. And uh, I kind of feel like, and I know it's a little bit too soon to be honest, but um, I feel like from here on in, everybody's going to be looking at the, uh, his uh, rear end as he's um, skating towards this back-to-back Art Ross. Your thoughts, Sean? Oh, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, he's got this locked up. He's going to get 40 goals, 100 points, easy. And, uh, you know, with, with the game, I mean, even though they're out of it, you know, when you play a divisional rival like L.A. and they got their next games against Anaheim, it's it's pretty easy for the team to kind of get up for the game, you know. And I know they're, they all want to do it for Connor, but, I mean – except for maybe the third line the other line seemed to be going pretty good tonight too and uh yeah i don't i don't think there's any doubt connor's going to win this uh win the art ross and i mean you can just see it when he scores he's so determined right and i'm sure the team feeds off that as well so yeah i'm i'm pretty confident that he's going to he's going to wrap up the art ross for sure <laughs> Yeah, he's uh, he just looks like he's on another level lately. How many points has he had in the last? Um, he's had what seven? This would be nine points in the last three games. Is that right? Is that accurate? Well, he had a game where he was zero, and then he got four. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. He, he had the um, he got shut out one game. That was against Tampa Bay, the three to one uh, game. That was you know that was their that's been their worst game. Granted the. Um, level of competition hasn't been great but i think tonight was in my mind the one where he's you know uh, you could a lot of people were arguing that um you know he's playing against the worst save percentages in the league uh then he comes out and scores two on um on jonathan quick uh you know phenomenal that Aberg goal and um mcdavid's goal very similar and uh dry tried the same thing a, a little bit later um, or after Aberg's goal, do you think uh, they recognize something like Quicks maybe being a little bit too relaxed going post to post? Yeah, probably. It's uh, if it worked once, why why not try it again, right? Yeah, you don't see those goals um, that often, not at the NHL level. I mean, typically the goalie can get over before the guy gets his stick out front and and into the net, but. Um, yeah, they scored two and almost scored a third. Can I can I say something real quick? Yeah, uh, for sure. Th- there's one thing that I've always wanted to mention, and even on Twitter or wherever, and it always bugs me, and I don't un- I don't understand why it doesn't happen in the NHL more. But especially every time I watch LA, I see Jonathan Quick. I th- I think the exact same thing. I don't understand why more guys don't pick the puck up, lift the puck on their stick, and just tuck it into the top corner. Like that lift and you know what I mean? Like the Mike leg goal where he picks it, he scoops the puck up and just tucks in the top corner. Jonathan Quick is always so low in the net and takes away the lower part of the net. If it, And we see it every once in a while in junior or in college. Some guy will do it once a year and everybody go, oh, what an amazing play and whatever. Like, <laughs> I don't understand why they don't do that more in the NHL. It's such an easy play. I mean, even you know going to London Knights games and that, you see guys do that in practice. Obviously, the NHLers can do it. And again, with a guy like Quick always taking that lower part of that, I don't understand. And Cassian, a lot of the times, you see him behind the net, and nobody's coming to him, and he's looking, 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 looking to pass. All he has to do is pick that puck up and just tuck it in, and it's an automatic goal. 
it's almost like it's a faux pas in the NHL. Like, don't do that. That's just something you don't do. But it would there would be so many more goals if the guys did that. It's I don't know. It's just every time I see LA, I think of that. It just it bugs me. I don't know why they don't do it more often. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you're wrong, Kelly. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, it's it might be sort of a hot dog type of move. I I remember that goal uh, Crosby did in junior where. You know they, you know they talked about whether he should have even done it, right? Um, very similar, right? What's your thoughts, Kelly? Yeah, I think there's a lot of unwritten rules that we don't know about, and uh, that that might be one of them. You just don't, just be maybe because that that kind of goal is is so easy to to score, and given the the skill level of the players involved. Um, you know, they just frown upon it. <laughs> I don't know, but like, but well, why? I don't, like, I don't know. I don't. I don't understand why that's a problem. A goal's a goal. Who cares how you score it, right? Oh yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's just to say. I don't know if it's any different from like you know, trying to take out the other team's goalie. You know, just going head first into him and taking him out. It's just you well, can do a, it. That's the big teams don't. Yeah, that's illegal. I guess this one's legal technically as long as it's you know waist high. But uh, I don't know whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'd be you'd be a hundred percent right on quick. I mean that's um, that's his kind of mo, right? He's down and and tight to the bottom part of the post. Yeah, you know, that's that is that's totally his mo. He's got the fastest. He's probably got some of the fastest feet in the NHL. Just like and he's so flexible. And uh, you know, he, if you've ever seen him without equipment, he's He's real stocky. He's real muscular build. He's not your Patrick Wall build, um, but he gets he gets right down there, and he's just because of his quickness, he gets out ahead of the the shooter a little bit and takes down the angle, so they can't go over his shoulder. But like uh, you notice that that first goal today, his his like leg was in the net yeah. when when Abor put it in. Like what was he? <laughs> why was he so far? back there like that and how, why didn't why didn't he know where the puck was and, and where it could have been going um but like getting back to you know mcdavid's scoring race he's winning the scoring race he's he's a lot healthier now is, is what the pundits have been talking about and i think that's all he has to worry about all he has to worry about is getting goals every night whereas um guys like Kucherov and Giroux and all these guys, they're in a playoff race. So they not only do they have to worry about scoring, they have to worry about their team getting getting in the uh, in the playoffs and winning games. Whereas Connor doesn't have that that pressure right now, right? Yeah, no, fair enough. I mean that's uh that's absolutely a big uh big part of it. I think um you know he's just out there for one one thing alone now. Uh I, I'm not that I you know, I think if it were if it were us in a playoff race, he'd still be Connor McDavid. Um, you know what surprises me though is is based on the start of the season is uh, thirty eight goals. Like he's going to top forty this year. Mm. Um, is do you think he's a fifty goal scorer in the future? Uh, I don't. I don't see why not. I mean. He, he definitely has the he definitely has the talent to do it um is it will it be dependent on his line mates and like and like what if the power play was clicking this year would he be the would he be uh alongside line a and ovechkin for the goal scoring lead yeah that that to me is maybe the most telling thing about this season right if you uh you look uh he's got 16 points on the power play this year um you know and and uh, you go to a guy like uh, Kucherov has 34 points on the power play this year um over double right and uh it, you know dry cycles the same thing i think uh dry cycles around um, i'm not 100% sure but around 12 14 points on the power play um you know, you if you double that, which is where a team with this kind of talent on the power play should be in that 34, 35 point uh, uh, area about this time of year. Um, I think he's already topped 100 if um, yeah. 
you know, if he's, if, if they're getting some, uh, something back from their power play, uh, what'd you guys think? Um, you know, talk about the power play. what do you think, uh, tonight, uh, maybe Sean, what's uh, your initial thoughts on uh, today's power play? I noticed they put Aberg out there instead of Strom. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about not having Strom on that top power play and maybe putting somebody else there. I was a little surprised to see Aberg, but not unhappy, especially given the game mm-hmm. he was having. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I don't think it was bad. I mean, clearly they still need that big shot from the point. And I mean, I mean, you're hoping Ethan Bear is going to be that guy down the road. And, you know, if Clef bombs healthy, then hopefully, you know, he can do something there. But, um, yeah, I don't know. The power play just doesn't really, it still doesn't, they still kind of look out of sync to me. They pass too much and I don't know what it is systematic wise or whatever, but, um, I still think they need that big right-handed shot on there and, you know, hopefully either, you know, it's pulley RV next year or they get some, somebody else they bring in there. I still think they're missing something, but, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, tonight in, in particular, I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was great, but, um, the, I guess that's pretty much it. Yeah, they had one stretch where they dominated the um, power play. I couldn't believe yeah. it didn't go in. And then they had, uh, of course, starting a period on a power play just never seems to go well for any team. Uh, so when they came into the um, was it the third period, I think, up on the power play, just about two minutes left, uh, that looked awful. That was when uh, Dreisaitl um, gifted, uh, was it Thompson the puck? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dreisaitl had a rough game tonight. I know, uh, Kelly, you mentioned that uh, as well. I mean, he seemed to be fighting the puck. Uh, your thoughts on the power play tonight, Kelly? Anything else that uh, you might have picked up on? It's weird. It's I don't know if it's just the Oilers, but like from watching other teams play, when because most of the most of the NHL teams use the same penalty kill. They use that that check press, and and that's okay as long as you don't get running around, right? And that's what we saw earlier in the year when the when the penalty kill was was atrocious with the Oilers is that nobody knew where to go and there was a lot of miscommunication this guy's running around and now that would leave the the power play with a you know a man open for a one time or just all the lanes everywhere and so that's uh, I've seen it only a few times in the past maybe a couple of weeks where the Oilers have gotten the other team you know kind of twisted up inside themselves and and with the way they move the puck around um but these are just they're all young guys and they you know they all want to make a really pretty play it's it's stuff we've been watching since like the hall days it's just everyone want to make a cute highlight play instead of just playing it simple getting the shots on the net and uh crashing the blue paint and and you know forcing a puck in you know there's we don't have like i think when maroon played he was a nice net front presence he wasn't afraid to get to get right up in there and uh you know you take a puck in the neck if he had to um but tonight you know it's just yeah it's just so frustrating they they get things sorted and then they they give up the puck because they're they're trying to force a pass or whatever and you know even bear is going to be a good power play quarterback one day but it's not he's not there yet and next year he's not going to be there yet so they need a guy who is versed in running a power play who knows how to put a shot on the net and get it through um because basically that's all they need right they, i don't know if they need an al mcginnis back there they just need a guy that can get a puck through to the net what do you guys think well yeah if if you consider the fact that ethan bear is playing his first uh you know nhl minutes this year uh or ever and um, when he does take that shot uh from the from the blue line and it gets through we're getting good opportunities from it now it's just going to be consistency right and that's uh you know you you can't ask that of uh, a young kid that's you know just starting out in the nhl and and uh, there's been a lot of um you know He's had a few sort of mental errors, I thought, just about every game. Just enough to kind of say, ah, he's not quite ready yet. And uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, Oilers fans don't uh, 
don't get on this kick where he needs to be playing because um, I would love to see him develop more uh, in the AHL. And actually, who cares what the fans say? <laughs> uh, I hope Torelli and uh, and them don't get on this uh, kick that uh, he should be playing. He he definitely there's a player there. Like he's um, he's going to be you know a top four D man one day and an offensive uh, player. He's showing uh, he showed us some highlights, but um, like tonight he came out from behind the net there and lost the puck. Uh, you know, granted that wasn't his fault. I think Puliarvi um, or can't remember who it was didn't get the puck out of the zone, but um, at the same time he had a little bit of a gaff and and almost uh, led to a scoring opportunity for LA, but he's got little things like that every game and just enough for me to, to say, uh, I'd love to see him go and get, you know, his confidence under him. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so guys, I think this would be a good time for a uh, quick break. And uh, when we get back, uh, let's talk about um, George LaRock and uh, some of the other news around Euler world. When we're back. And welcome back to the Oilers Live podcast. I've got Sean from theoilnight.ca and Kelly from Beer League Heroes as my guests tonight. Uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit more Oilers hockey. Of course, we're just coming off of a 3-2 Oilers win, uh, which uh, the win wasn't quite as important as uh, Connor McDavid regaining the uh, Art Ross lead for the first time this season. Uh, so that was good news. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, news uh, about the Oilers from around the league. Most, uh, the biggest thing was, oh, pardon me, um, Kelly, you uh, you uh, put an article out about it on Beer League Heroes today. George LaRock uh, suggesting that there's a, another reason for Hall being traded that those of us uh, not in the know didn't know about. So you want to just uh, tell us what you heard? Yeah, hold on. I want to bring up the uh, the the website, the quote. What he what he actually said. We basically alluded to that McDavid was having substance abuse issues and was on his way to rehab um, when they when the Oilers traded him, and that he uh, he needed to get out of Edmonton. Um, basically so that so, I mean this it's not this isn't new news to anyone that that lives in Edmonton or kind of pays attention to the the nightlife scene in Edmonton um, it's a small place man and I don't know if these hockey players like if they're ignorant about what they do in public or who they're with but you know it's 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 kind of ridiculous that, that it gets out but um, for LaRock to do it is is interesting. I need to question his motives. I don't know why he would why he would uh, come out now and say something like that in public. But for like I said, for for those of us in the know a little bit, yes, it's nothing new. Halsey's been that way since he was junior, right, Sean? <laughs> Don't open this on me. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I live in London, so I've never been a Taylor Hall fan because he played for Windsor, right? Um, but I mean, realistically, all jokes aside, if he had an addiction problem, then I'm glad he got it resolved. And and uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, let's be honest. There's it's not a big surprise that hockey players like to dabble in the off season and whatever, right? Um, and now, obviously, his. In his particular case, it got a little extreme and, and whatever. And, and we're all just assuming this is true, right, based on George Rock. Um, I don't know why George Rock would just make it up, why he would lie. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have a lot to say on it. The only, the only thing for me is, well, A, I don't know why, why LaRock brought it up, really, um, unless he's trying to get a, a position on Shirelli's staff. And, uh, and second, I mean, so many people criticize Shirelli for the trade hall for Larson straight up, all these armchair GM saying, Oh, it was ridiculous. And my contention has always been 
obviously if he had a better deal on the table, he would have took it. Do you think he's just stupid? He just would have took the lesser of a deal. Obviously that was the market value. Forget of you know what all the other stuff that was going on. Clearly that was the best deal and he took it. So you know, and people still rip on them even today about it, right? And well, now we find out, well, there was other things going on and it, it looks even better as of today. Um, so, I mean, that that's all I, really I take from it is, you know, Shirelli did a great job and Taylor all has some demons and whatever. I'm glad he's overcome those and it looks like he's having a great year and, and, and that's great. I'm just going to kind of leave it at that. Yeah, I, you know what, you're, um, you're probably dead on. Uh, there's, um, you know, we, there's, that's going around hockey, right? I mean, some some guys get it uh, looked after, some don't. I had an uncle that could have probably played in the NHL years ago, but um, had his own problems. Uh, you know, these these things happen. Uh, hockey players are around it. We, we've all played hockey. We grew up around that, and and um, you know, some of us were lucky enough it didn't uh, affect us. Um, you know, I think uh, let's hope. Uh, I guess let's hope that uh, Taylor Hall's worked it out. But you're probably the probably the biggest story here is exactly your point, Sean. Is that um, you know maybe the Chirelli trade uh, for Larson? Maybe that's what he could get, and this probably had some bearing on it. And it's just another one of those things that. Um, you know, you can, uh, well, people will hear what they want to hear, right? They'll still probably go on this, tr- go off on the trade. But um, I think that probably had something to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the other thing is that it, maybe Edmonton wasn't the best place for Hall to do his rehab in either. Do you know what I mean? Like maybe sending him out to the East Coast away from all the, you know, the media and stuff in Edmonton was was the best choice and that was Chiarelli doing Hall a favor you know you know without really telling Hall that I think that she really should get some some credit for you know helping helping Hall with that yeah I think uh that that probably um and we won't know the truth behind that so I yeah I think the um the true, uh, like the two things I mean we we just talking about it I mean what was LaRock's uh, motivation for it I have my my theory is just Laroque this year has been pretty vocal about the team anytime he's had airtime, right? Um, yeah, and uh, and I think it's just Laroque being Laroque. He is a um, you know he might be an ex player, but he's he's actually in my mind he's probably one of the biggest Oiler fans out there. Right. I mean, he uh, he's traveled to Edmonton to watch the playoff games last year, uh, despite you know not. Uh, I, from my understanding, he got in trouble from uh, his boss at the radio station for making the trip. Uh, you know, he's he was in Vegas uh, when they were there. He follows the team. Uh, he's constantly on Oilers radio. I think this is just Laroque being Laroque, and and you give him um, some airtime, and he's going to tell you what he knows. And I think he's probably a pretty honest guy, and and. Uh, you know, just speaks what's on the top of his head. I don't think it's any more than that, really. Yeah, well, he, he's he's been pretty vocal in the past about drugs, though. Like, I remember he came out in his book, he said there was, the NHL has a drug problem. I, I don't know, that was five or six years ago, maybe. He talked about that, how there was, guys were using steroids and stuff, and then he came out about the, a lot of players using ephedrine and things like that. Like, he's pretty, he's been pretty adamant about that all along, right? So, um, you know, I mean, uh, obviously Hall's not the only one. I'm sure there's many other players that are in rehab or whatever, but because he's just focused on the Oilers, that's what he's bringing up. Um, but he, he's pretty keen when it comes to, you know, drugs in, in the NHL. So I'm not surprised that that's one of the things that he's kind of touched on. But like you said, he's, he's very in tune with the Oilers and, and that's probably some of the motivation behind it. But I'm sure he knows a lot more about a lot of other players as well that he just hasn't mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably right there for sure. Uh, guys, let's talk a little bit about some of the other um, uh, things around the Oilers uh, right now. And, and um, I will uh, put this link in the show notes uh, when I publish, uh, but this is the March 22nd edition of around the Oilogosphere 
Uh, you find it on beerleagueheroes.com. Uh, there'll be a link off of the uh, main page. Uh, but if we go in there, uh, basically, Kelly, you've um, you've started a new kind of digest, if you will, of uh, you know people what they're either podcasting about, uh, like on here today, or um, you know what uh, some of the writers are are writing about. Of course, you don't, um, unfortunately, because there's a paywall on the athletic. You're not putting any of those up. But uh, if you guys, uh, if anybody out there, um, I would suggest subscribing to the athletic. There's some good uh, good uh, content on there. Uh, let's start with um, Craig Simpson's comments on Pugliarvi this week. Uh, Kelly, uh, did you hear them? And uh, what were your thoughts on that? I uh, I was listening to Oilers now when he was when he was talking about uh, he, talking about Pooley Arvey and he basically just said that you know uh, he's a kid you know he's immature and that they need to keep a short a short lease on short leash on him instead of kind of like going the way they did with the with the other young guys and uh, really just keeping tabs on his on his development right um, which um. I'm fine with um, the Pooley Harvey can can stay on the third line. Um, in my opinion, it's a good place for him. He's like this is why I don't get the push from the fans and some media and stuff like that. Is that they they think because he was the fourth overall pick and and that um, you know Dubois and Line and Matthews are all lighting it up for their teams that that he should also be lighting it up for the Oilers beside. Drysaddle and, and McDavid, and he, you know he's he's still 19 years old, um, and it's he's developing not only as a as a professional hockey player, but as a you know a young man in a new country, um, and uh, he he needs to be brought along slowly. By the time he's 21, like like say Mika Rantanen is, he's he's going to be ridiculous, um, and he's going to be a a huge two-way threat for the Oilers. So let him, let him marinate and, and get the proper guidance, um, and t- until then, but don't force him into a position where he's going to have to face the, the dowdies and, you know, these defensemen that are just going to ruin him. Um, he's but, also come out the last two games, just flying like tonight. This first period was outstanding. I thought, yeah, no doubt. He'll have those games because he's so young, right? The highs are highs and the lows are really low. And he's not he's not exceptional in the same way that that, that Line A and Matthews are, right? So like I think Dubois, the guy that was picked ahead of him from Columbus, is a is a pretty good guy to use as a benchmark, right? Because Columbus sent him back to junior for a year. And you know, maybe the Oilers shouldn't uh screwed around with Pugliarvi in that first year and maybe they should have sent him back to Finland or you know had him play CHL hockey for a year instead of tossing him right into the fire um, I think they made a mistake um, dealing with him that way and perhaps if they had had more wing depth this year he'd be playing AHL the whole year instead of being up in the in the NHL now mind you he, he was on a He's on basically a 17 goal pace, and 17 goals for a 19 year old in the NHL is pretty bloody good. Um, but I think that he doesn't know what it's like to live in the fishbowl that is Edmonton, and to put him in the spotlight could could ruin him. Yeah, I I, um, I think you're probably dead on on that. I the only thing maybe that um, surprised me about Simpson's comments, uh, and Sean, I'll get your opinion on this too. But I thought. Um, I thought that Simpson seemed to kind of hint that maybe Pugliarvi's work ethic off the ice wasn't as strong as it could be. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you caught that, but uh, that was some of what I took. I didn't read um, you linked on your on the website to uh, to Staples article on uh, cult of hockey. I assume I assume it was Staples. Um, but uh, you know, I I, I kind of got the impression from Simpson that he didn't think Pugliarvi was uh, maybe off the ice working as hard, and and um, it, you know what's possible is you know he could hear something from. I think Simpson's tied in pretty good into the team with, uh, of course, Dylan being around. Uh, 
your thoughts on that, Sean? Did you did you hear the um, interview at all on Oilers now? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. What's your thoughts there? Well, I respect Craig Simpson a great deal. I, I think he's um, I think he's very intelligent. I think he knows the game, and he knows he's. I, I think he speaks the truth. And when he was talking about Pulley I'm not so I'm not so sure he was talking about off the ice as much because I think he did acknowledge that he, you know he worked out well in in whatever. But I think his main his main issue was on the ice that uh, he was just saying that Pulley Arvey just kind of needs to take the bull by the horns and just kind of be more assertive on the ice kind of thing. Right. And don't let him develop lazy habits. I think that's kind of more, more what he was getting at. Um, you know, don't, don't let the coach take you out of the top six kind of thing. Right. So, yeah. um, and I get it. I mean, I mean, Pulley Arvey has all the talent and he does look like, I mean, for me, sometimes it looks like he's having too much fun and he's not, he's not getting, you know, he's not getting dirty enough sometimes. Right. He's just, he, I mean, he's not that he's not giving effort, but he's not giving it a hundred percent all the time. Right. Um, and, and like, I get what, what Simpson is saying. If, if he wants to, I kind of want him to have the, you know, I don't give a fuck attitude. Nobody's going to stop me and go out there and just dominate. Instead, he's kind of, you know, lollygagging it and having fun and smiling and still kind of trying in that, but just he doesn't have that deter enough determination yet. And I and I, I think that's what Simpson's getting at. That's kind of the main point. So um, I didn't take it as an off and ice thing. I, I think it's it's solely on the ice. He needs to be more determined in order to dominate. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, that's probably accurate. I, I listened to it as well. I, I thought I, I got the impression he was talking off the ice, but I guess, you know what, you know, and I'm thinking about the interview now it's, it's very well, he could have been talking on the ice. I'm with you. Craig Simpson is, um, you know, he's a good hockey mind, uh, smart guy, definitely worth listening to, uh, and taking his impression. And I, you know what, I think he, you know, as I said, not not just that um you know he used to play for the Oilers but uh I think he's he's in tune with the Oilers you know much like LaRock would be right he's got of course and he knows all the guys from back in the day so if anybody knows what's going on there it's him uh and he's a good he's a good London boy too oh is he <laughs> yeah he's, he's one of the main reasons why I became an Oilers fan I got his autograph as a kid and uh yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about Craig Simpson. Yeah, right on, right on. Uh, yeah, and uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Sean's uh, based in London. And uh, so if they came through there, Sean knows. Big fan. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, let's talk about, uh, you just going down the list, um, an article off of Oilers Nation. Uh, no surprise, um, you know, discussing replacements for Todd McClellan. Actually, I'm surprised there's not one. Uh, I guess the biggest surprise might be that you don't have a link to three replacements for uh, Chirelli. Um, but uh, let's talk about uh, talk about this. Um, you know, maybe we'll start with Sean. Do you think uh, you think there's hope for Todd McClellan to stay on past this season? Uh, and if there's not. Um, well, you what uh, what do you think? Is there, you know, somebody in mind that you might uh, immediately think of for the role? Bye, Felicia. <laughs> He's gone. Get rid of him. I mean, the whole season has just been a disaster from the worst penalty kill and the worst power play and can't put the lines together and the fans and the media scream and put Nuge with McDavid and he doesn't do it. He's too stubborn. And he screws around with Dry Sidle and he screws around with Pulley Arvey and he screws around with Slapshev. I mean, he is he's history. There's no question about it. Get rid of Shirelli. Or I mean, sorry, get rid of McClellan. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't know, I think I was reading a hop a hop cut tweet. Um, <laughs> so, I mean McClellan's gone for sure. There's no question about it. Um as far as replacements. I think I, I'm pretty sure I just saw something not too long ago about changes in Chicago and, and Quinville looks, it looks like he's going to be gone. And I remember tweeting out something there not too long ago, an article last year of Stan Bowman saying big changes were needed. And they went out and made some trades with, you know, Brandon trading away Panarin for Brandon Saad and bringing in Patrick Sharp. And they did all these moves 
and the team still sucks and they still didn't make the playoffs. Um, well, I know they made the playoffs before, but they, they failed miserably. Um, so I, I think Quinville's gone for sure. Um, as far as replacements, if the Oilers looking at it, I think Quinville's probably your number one guy. I don't know why he wouldn't be. Um, he gets canned by Chicago. Edmonton should be calling him the second that happens. If for whatever reason that doesn't happen, um, as you probably know, I've been pretty adamant about Chris Knobloch, who's an assistant coach on Philadelphia, and he was mm-hmm. Connor McDavid's junior coach. He loves fast pace hockey, and uh, and he's good with working with young players. But um, yeah, I think it's a no brainer. I think that's kind of the number one priority of McClellan when McClellan gets let go, which will be the last game of the season right after. Um, you call up Joel Quinville and you get him in there, and I think he's going to make a huge difference. Yeah, I uh, I think Quenville uh, and listening to I listened to uh, Section three twenty eight uh, this week um, and uh, I I tweeted out about it. But uh, for those of you that um, get a chance, listen to that uh, podcast Section three twenty eight. I had the guy on the show. Uh, at the very least, they're entertaining. It's not their fault that they were born uh, near a hockey team uh, called the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, so we, we, you know, you can't fault them for that. You got to be fans of your home team. Um, but, uh, outside of that, the guys are very entertaining, pretty good on the hockey side, but they were talking about Quenville as well. So he's going to be a sought after commodity, no doubt. Uh, And there's no doubt he's gone. Um, you know, that's my thoughts. Uh, Kelly, your thoughts is, uh, is uh, I was about to say Shirelli as well. Um, is McClellan, is McClellan gone at the end of the season? Uh, and, uh, if he is, uh, you know, who, who would you take or who do you think is, um, a, po- a potential? There's a, it always goes back to what Nicholson said, right? About basically saying like, if there's a better option out there, then maybe a, a change will happen. So it's basically saying like, they're just going to wait and see who gets canned at the end of the, at the end, probably at the end of the first round of the playoffs, I imagine. Because you're going to have guys like Trotz and, and whatnot who are also on the uh, on the uh, the hot seat. Maybe Boudreaux in Minnesota. I wonder if um, Chuck Fletcher um, survives the off season in Minnesota. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's one of those things. Um, I'm I don't know if I feel as strong as Sean in that he'll get fired at the end of the year. Um, but if if one of those Hall of Fame coaches is uh, is available, like Quenville or, or even Boudreaux, uh, it's it's so hard not to say, you know, like take a hike, Todd, and uh, enjoy your your days in Kelowna, um, and and go ahead and hire a Quenville. But it's it's going to be on Quenville, and it, and and it's going to be on other teams too, right? Um, what is Carolina going to do at the end of the year? You know, they got a new owner who's like, who won't pay his GM any money, but, but how much will he pay a coach? Um, so, um, I think like options, I like my thing was that they wouldn't, they wouldn't fire McClellan, but they'd, they'd fire Woodcroft, you know, just to kind of, the necessary sacrifice just to see how it goes for 20 games in the next season. And then maybe like, uh, if it's still like kind of rough after game 10 or, or 12, then go ahead and see what, you know, Rocky Thompson's doing or like Sean said, Chris Knobloch, um, maybe Todd Nelson, uh, something, some of these, you know, high end AHL coaches, uh, just to, to bring in as an assistant to kind of run their power play and whatnot. And then if if they decided that McClellan wasn't their guy, then they'd have kind of a built-in replacement, you know, uh, right there, right there f- for the team. Um, that's kind of, the, it seems to me like the more realistic way about going about it. Yeah, yeah. So I think my my personal thoughts on it, right, are um, you know if I'm gonna maybe side closer with uh, Sean on this, I think McClellan is for sure gone. 
in the summer. I you uh, you posted that uh, clip from CBC uh, on Beer League Heroes uh, with Connor McDavid. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, uh, suggesting. You know, maybe it'd be nice to get some time with uh, with the good winger. It was just constant time with yeah. line mates, right? Instead of like switching yeah. it up every twenty minutes. Well, that's a big thing too. Yeah. So I mean, he. You know, I mean, you don't. Uh, he doesn't say that if it's not. There's no meaning behind it in my mind. Uh, so that you know, that's a big thing. So it's possible he's um, he's checked out. I, I I find it hard to believe that you can give Todd McClellan uh, the benefit of a good end of season, given that the line, the lineup t- right now is, is the lineup everyone else but him was suggesting from, you know, I'd say 10, 10 games in. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a little too late. I think if you do see him back, uh, next season, I would suggest 20 games would be, uh, you know, really high. Um, yeah. We'd probably be looking at something in the first five games uh, if they came out, uh, you know, if they came out 0-5, mm. uh, he'd be gone immediately. And I wouldn't be surprised uh, if his uh, replacement was already waiting in the wings, um, just waiting to sign uh, a contract um, you know, without any, uh, any long-term wait, uh, for a new head coach. Uh, and if he goes, uh, obviously I think the, you know, the whole coaching staff goes with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is with, the thing is with that though, you, I mean, you can't really do that because who's going to be sitting around waiting for a phone call five game, five games into the season. Right. It's going to be, if you're going to make a move, you need to be fast. You need to be swift in the off season. You can't say, okay, well, we're going to hang on to you and then we'll see what happens in the first 10 games. And then you've, you've limited your options. There's nobody available. Right. So, um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty confident it's a no brainer. He's, he's gone. Forget it. See you later. And they're going to find somebody that's available in this offseason because you, because you can't you can't take that risk and after having such a horrible season somebody's got to take the fall and the fact that like you said mike that you know he's not doing you know he wasn't doing what what everybody said he should have done you know 10 games into the season um you know now that everything's working that everybody said you should do this now that it's working i mean that's even more testament why he has to go so i mean i think it's a no-brainer but it's up to me. Or it's up to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to remember, like, the way they still have Paul Coffey, like, sniffing around, and Friedman said on a couple of occasions, Paul Coffey and coach in the same sentence. Now, I don't think that means head coach, but, I, you know, I wouldn't doubt if it meant coaching in capacity. Um, so, and we know that since Gretzky's a minority owner in the team now, he's got his hand in things. And for that, from what I've been told, he's... He's kind of he, he's making movers already, um, so and that doesn't speak much uh, for Chiarelli either. Um, maybe making some strong suggestions to Peter as to what he should be uh, looking at or who he should be talking to. Um, but that's 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 something too. Like, yeah, if if McClellan doesn't survive the summer. Are the Oilers going to go back, uh, reach back into their Hockey Canada pockets, and uh, and use Nicholson's contacts? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good possibility. I mean, it's um, I think you know the the hard part for us right now today, obviously, even speculating is um, there's going to be uh, this has been probably the oddest year from a coaching standpoint ever, uh, which might be why McClellan has stayed on. Mm-hmm. And nobody's been let go, right? So, um, you know, McClellan's, uh, you know, his uh, his time as head coach of the Oilers may just be, um, you know, numbered by uh, who the who the next coach is that gets let go. Once that domino falls, um, there might be a lot of movement, and I suspect um, 
that's the case. You might be right there, Sean. After the first uh, first round, we might see uh, a number of different things happen. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. One second, real quick. Don't forget, too, that Daryl Cates, there was that report there earlier in the season that he was looking to make a coaching change halfway through the season, right, in January or whatever it was, too. So I think that's pretty telling to as far as what's going to happen. Yeah. Is this the year um, – now I'm going to go completely off topic, but that brings something to mind. Um, it's on topic, but off topic. So we've got uh, Dundas come in uh, to Carolina, who clearly, you know, here's a guy that's connected in the sports world, right? You know, Top Golf. He's connected with uh, Mark Cuban or Cuban, uh, and uh, you know, we've got uh, Melnick in Ottawa. Uh, rumors of Daryl Cates suggesting a coaching change. Uh, the guys in um, here in Calgary, you know, forcing their hand on a uh, new arena. Is this the? Um, is this a, is this a trend? I mean, in the NHL, uh, where the owners are going to be a little bit uh, more involved uh, in the day to day. You know, are we going to see that uh, over the next little while? Uh, maybe some more speaking out on, on who's who. I, I mean, we've seen it in the past, but um, it just feels like, um, especially this Dundas thing and the Melnick thing, uh, that maybe they're getting a little bit more brazen. Uh, you know, any thoughts on that at all? This is not something we, we were going to discuss tonight, but uh, <laughs> the Kate's thing kind of brought it to mind. So if you guys don't have any opinions on it, we can move right along. Well, I hope not. I mean, it, I think the owners should just be the owners and let the professionals, you know, the general managers, whatever, do their job. That's why you hire them in the first place. Like, what's the point of having a general manager if you're going to be so hands on? It's like a Jerry Jones thing in, in, in Dallas. It drives me nuts. You're the owner. You own the team. Sit back and, and, and reap the rewards. Um, and then if you want to make changes, fine. But don't don't handle you know player personnel and stuff like that like that drives me absolutely nuts uh, i don't know how kelly feels but that's yeah i go crazy over things like that your thoughts kelly yeah i don't know i never like uh i'm a little young to remember like the harold ballard days where you know kind of ran the show for toronto um is that some kind of uh, jab at Sean and I? Or what? <laughs> are, 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 are we like the same age? <laughs> no, we are. We are. I'm, Harold Ballard is a little bit too old for me, too. <laughs> anyway, go on. Sorry the jab at the Leafs, you know, other fans. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't. And like, like what Sean says, like, they just stick to their own. But, like, it wasn't. The story about Cates didn't get out until Friedman told it on his podcast. So, had he said nothing, we wouldn't we would never known anything about that. Whereas, like Dundon, <laughs> he's been like he's been all over it, and same with Melnick. And you know, I'm not sure if it's I'm not I don't know what Melnick's motivation is. Like he's doing a hell of a job of driving fans away, uh, you know. And whereas Dundon just seems like he's a, uh, he's an outspoken personality, um, you know, in hockey, hockey doesn't tend to like, it doesn't accept those kind of personalities so much. Uh, they, they like quiet people that go about their business and don't rock the boat. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if Batman just kind of stepped in on Dundon and said like, calm the hell down buddy you know i represent the owners let me do the talking you know just to take it easy the same and same with mail like too i guess so i'm gonna go back to um the section 328 podcast i listened to them they were talking about the uh, dundon um four hundred thousand dollar a year salary for the gm uh they um they did they did say something which they thought you know hearing that uh about that um potential salary and it's kind of quieted down a little bit uh they thought that it was a little bit odd because when dundon came in he said the team might not have a lot of money but i've got a lot of money to make this team work right and so um that wouldn't make much sense uh for him to come in and then you know low ball gms in the league um yeah, it, who knows? I mean, we're going to find out. It's sort of quieted down a little bit. 
Uh, obviously though, um, you know, you listen to Friedman who's, you know, as connected as anybody and, and he seems to, uh, suggest that the reason for the low ball, uh, salary would be, um, you know, he wants a little bit more of a say it sounded, uh, he, he mentioned on his podcast, Friedman did that, um, Dundon was talking a little bit about a, like a, you know, a, a red light, yellow light, green light sort of scenario where, you know, he, himself and uh, whoever the GM was, uh, they'd have um, some idea of certain things that would be, you know, sort of green light the GM could do on their own. Uh, yellow light, uh, you know, uh, might go and, and uh, you know, he may or may not talk to Dundon, but then there would be certain things where uh, he'd have... Um, he'd have definite say in terms of how the team was operated. So, uh, you know, he may just be looking for somebody who's, uh, you know, more of a figurehead in that role than an actual NHL style GM, like we're what, like we're used to. Yeah. He's looking for a yes man. Basically it, it's ridiculous. If, if you're an owner, hire a GM, let him do his job. I, it's like I said, it's just like Jerry Jones in football. He wants to be hands on and, and make moves. Just, stay out of it and let the GM do his job. There's no wonder no one wants to take the GM job in Carolina because the, the, the owner's so hands-on, they can't even do it. Like it's, they're micromanaged. Like it's crazy. I don't know. It drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. So anyway, that was, uh, that was off, uh, off topic. Um, I think we're uh, a little bit uh, over on what uh, I'd like the second segment to be, so we'll take um, we'll take a bit of a break and uh, come back and finish things up. Oilers Live Podcast. Welcome back to the Oilers Live Podcast. I've got uh, on tonight's episode Sean from theoilnight.ca and Kelly from Beer League Heroes. Uh, moments ago, we were talking offline, uh, not being recorded, uh, about the OHL playoffs. Uh, Sean is a, uh, good London boy and, uh, big Knights fan, uh, who doesn't think those of us in Oilers land would care how the London Knights are doing, but, uh, will tell us, uh, he maybe can give us a little bit of a lowdown on the Oilers prospects that are currently playing in the OHL playoffs right now. Sean. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, Alex Formanton got a hat trick tonight for the London Knights, even though they lost. Um, that's significant because the Calgary Flames traded uh, their second round pick for Curtis Lazar, and that second round pick turned out to be Alex Formanton. So I hope he has a fantastic career in the NHL, <laughs> and Calgary looks like a bunch of dumbasses for trading it. Um, as far as the OHL goes, there's. Yeah, so the Oilers have two prospects playing. They've got Dmitry Samarukov playing for Guelph, and they got uh, Kirill Maximov playing for Niagara. If you follow me, obviously, you know I'm a huge Maximov fan. Not so much with Samarukov. Um, Niagara won the first game um, 4-2, and Maximov had a heck of a game. He got lit up by uh, Saron Noel, who is draft eligible early in the first period. Noel hit him with a huge a huge hit and maximoff was like what the fuck and then later on maximoff had a couple of huge hits himself and uh he had an assist in the game was a plus one but uh, niagara ended up winning the first game and they have a really good team they have a chance to go pretty far in the ohl playoffs so as as order fans we should be excited about that um sam Rukoff, not so much they uh they got destroyed by kitchener in the first game, they'll probably get swept. They might pull out one game. And, um, I mean, you know, if, again, if you follow the write-ups I've had about him, he's he's an offensive player, defenseman, but he really struggles defensively. He doesn't have a lot of um, consistency in his game. He kind of lacks intensity. And him and Ryan Merkley got destroyed. Kitchener just took it to them in the first game. So, um I would expect Guelph Samarukov to be gone first round and uh, keep your eyes on Maximoff, who, by the way, I've got ranked as the second best Oilers prospect next to Yamamoto uh, in the entire pipeline. So, yeah, yeah, he, um, 
Uh, from what I've seen, yeah, he's uh, he's a hell of a player. And it sounds like, uh, and from what you've said before and, and what I've seen, when he does get lit up, like that's not something that takes him out of the game. He's the kind of player that puts him right in there. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that about players, uh, some of the players that are, are like that. Yeah, well, and then that's, that's good yeah, and that's the thing too. Like I've compared him in the past to Evgeny Malkin and he, or no, well, that's Feshnikov, but he, he he's similar to, to dry saw, I would say Maximoff and he's, if he gets hit, he'll come back and hit you back. Like he's not, uh, he's not timid at all. Right. And you can't really take him out of his game. He'll just, he'll just respond. Right. So, um, you know, he's, he's kind of a bigger guy and he, you know, he's a right shot, which is great for in the future for the Oilers, but yeah, he's, uh, he's got a promising career for sure. So you mentioned uh, Yamamoto as uh, being number one prospect. Just to give you an update, uh, tonight uh, Spokane did uh, win their first game of the playoffs against uh, the Winter Hawks of Portland uh, in OT. Sounds like it was an exciting game. Yamamoto was uh, kept off the score sheet, um, but he had seven shots on net, which uh, you know I think is. Uh, you know, probably a pretty good sign that he's still, um, still, uh, still getting the shots. Um, he's been, he's been outstanding. I think, uh, you know, he was, he was over two points a game average, uh, down the stretch and, um, and, uh, sounds like he'll be a big part of this. I, I, I'd, I'd expect Spokane to, to come through, um, especially after winning a first one, although Portland's a pretty good team, I think. Mm-hmm from what I've been able to uh, put together. Uh, Kelly, you uh, have you been following any of the uh, Oilers prospects as they get through? I know um, the Frozen Four is on right now. Uh, of course, we're all kind of interested to hear about um, and maybe get you guys' opinions on uh, this trade of the um, third rounder for Cooper Marodi of the University of Michigan, who um, they won, uh, just to keep you updated, uh, they won today and move on to play Boston U. Uh, so they were playing North uh, Northeastern in the Northeast bracket, and uh, Boston U beat Cornell. Uh, so... Uh, their um, University of Michigan is the uh, second seed on that side. Uh, so they'll be in the, um, they're one win away from the Frozen Four, uh, which would be great to see uh, Oilers prospect uh, up there. Uh, it, Kelly, you've been um, tracking any of these guys at all, or you got any thoughts on it? Not, a, not so much the, uh, the Oilers prospects, just kind of casually from, just from Twitter, you know, I think, Stuart Skinner had a pretty good start to the uh, the playoffs. I think he got a shutout in game one of their series uh, with Moose Jaw. And just from what you said about Yamamoto, um, the uh, the Frozen Four is going to be something. You said that uh, Morody, he's his team is going to be playing uh, Boston University, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's Michigan and. Um, and so that'll be Quinn Hughes and, and Brady Kachuk going up against each other. And um, that's, uh, that's probably the more uh, something I'm more interested in than, than seeing how the, the Oilers prospect doing. I'm a little more like tuned into the, to the draft as we get later into the, uh, to the season. Um, I think, uh, who's the kid um, playing for Regina now? Is it Cameron Hobig? He big? Yeah. He big, yeah. yeah. So there's only a few out, out west uh, that are getting any action now. But I think but the the Hughes versus Kachuk thing I think is a is gonna be an interest, interesting narrative going into that uh, Frozen Four. It's something to keep an eye on nevertheless, because they're they're both players that could that could impact the Oilers uh, starting next season, possibly. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, obviously yeah, big probably maybe one of the bigger storylines, I guess. If you're just a fan of hockey, um, what's your thoughts on this uh, Cooper Morody? What do you guys think of that trade? You know, I mean, is it? it I I mean, my personal opinion is it's. Um, it's too early to tell who won or who lost. I mean, we're probably, uh, I sort of said at one point, we're two years away, but we're more likely three or four years away from even knowing, uh, given the fact that it's a third rounder. Uh, thoughts? You guys think anything of that? Uh, have you, um, either of you seen any of the highlights from Cooper Marodi? I mean, I, 
when you listen to some of the guys that know him uh, from, uh, you know, college hockey, they, they talk quite highly of him and to the point where I'm a little bit surprised that, um, uh, that uh, you'd trade a prospect like him away for a third rounder. Well, the thing is too, with, with Philly, they have so many guys that are already signed. Apparently they, I guess they couldn't really fit him in. And with, from an Oilers standpoint, I mean, they're kind of in a, not in a win now situation, but they want guys that are able to contribute in Bakersfield now. And, and Marodi's already, I think he's 20, I think he's 21 actually. Yeah, he's 21. He's okay. So he's 21. So he's, whether or not he comes this year, or he comes next year, he's a lot closer to Bakersfield than a third round pick would be probably three, four years kind of thing. So it makes a sense from an older standpoint and how many third round picks actually contribute. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but, um, so from the other standpoint, it makes sense. You've turned a third round pick who may contribute three, four years into a guy that can contribute in a, you know, two years kind of thing. Right. So, I mean, I get it. And he's a leading scorer on the team and they've got some good players on their team. Like, Kelly mentioned Quinn Hughes is there. They also got Josh Norris, who went first round to San Jose. He's a really good player. He's on the team as well. Um, and Marodi's pretty much got double the points almost everybody else. Um, so, I mean, from the other standpoint, it, it certainly makes sense. I haven't really seen any of his games, but um, it sounds like he has a lot of upside. So I think it's a good idea. Yeah, it's it really doesn't seem like a, a lose situation at all. Um, in fact, it's probably one of the better trades Chiarelli has made in a little while. Um, you know, uh, he he looks like he's got some upside. My understanding is, um, it, you know, I mean, well, not and this is not my understanding, but I, you got to figure that he's going to sign with the Oilers. Um, you know, right away, given that, uh, I think he, when does he get put back into the, um, into the, uh, or when does he become a free agent? It's after this season, I think, right. If he's not, uh, if he's not signed. Should we have to next season? I he think. has, he has one more year of eligibility, next. doesn't he? To play, to play college hockey. Cause this is year three. Yeah, he does. Yeah. So, uh, but it, you know what? I mean, it'd be interesting. Uh, I'd love to watch that game. I, let's find out uh, when that is. Because, uh, yeah, Quinn Hughes and uh, Kachuk, I mean, that's uh, that's one of those games um, that uh, could, uh, you know, have some meaning in terms of... Um, and Kachuk's uh, stock seems to be going up uh, a little bit lately. Um you know, I'd be, I'd be curious what, uh, you know, how that comes out and see these guys play against each other. Well, I thought it was funny too, that, uh, well, Peter Shirelli's daughter, is it, is it Talia? I think it's how you say it. She went to Michigan. She's in a Michigan alumni. So I wonder if she knows him personally, or they sent her out to help recruit him or whatever, or convince him to sign. Right. Somebody suggested that they were dating. I don't think that's true, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't hurt. You get an old Michigan alumni. Hey, come on, come sign with our team, right? It's. I don't think there's – people do question, why would you trade for a guy when you could just sign him when he becomes a free agent? But uh, if he's got a year left of eligibility, you have negotiating rights. You have that whole year to kind of recruit him and, you know, butter him up, whatever, and, and get him to, to sign on the dotted line. So, uh, I mean, ultimately – Assuming he does sign, it, it it looks like it's it's a good deal. So it looks like that game goes uh, tomorrow. You you can um, if you've got access to ESPN, uh, you can watch it there. It's on ESPN two. It's on at four p.m. Uh, just going off the link right now. It looks like it's blocked here. But uh, if you have a VPN or some some way to watch it, uh, or uh, you're savvy in that regard, I'm sure you'll find a way to stream that uh, stream that that game. So that's uh, I don't know if that's four p.m. Eastern time. That's probably most likely given their location. But uh, that's when it is. Uh, so number 10, Michigan versus, uh, well, I guess that would be number 10 in the season. Um, but yeah, so BU, uh, BU versus Michigan be a good, uh, be a good game to watch for sure. I'm, I'm going to see if I can't help, uh, if I can, can't find a way to stream that tomorrow. 
Uh, so, uh, are there any other prospects that you guys know about that are playing in the um, respective playoffs right now? I mean, uh, yeah, we've we talked about Skinner. We got Yamamoto. Uh, anything left? Um, you know, in the uh, in the rest of the um, in that season that uh, might change how you view uh who the oilers might look at when's the um draft lottery 28th is it the last day of the season 28th the, yeah april 28th the actual like when they draw to see who who gets the the picks is that what you mean no yeah. yeah yeah april yeah, 28th. Is that on the 28th so that's going to be uh that's going to be you know the biggest day of our Oilers hockey uh, <laughs> fan uh, fan night. It's not going to be as big as the uh, Connor McDavid draw. Although if we if we got picked for number one, I uh, I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> Probably pass out. I was pretty darn happy when we got picked for Connor McDavid. But if we got Dolan, I would think that um, people should just throw in the towel. Uh, those two would be I outstanding be together. Big, uh, you know, hoopla raised around the NHL. The rules would be changed if if that happened again because that's that's pretty unreal for something like that to happen so many times. Yeah, I would be. Um, I mean, but even if we got in uh, one, two, or three, uh, that would be good. We could um, right now. What are we sitting in? Uh, picking seventh if it goes in order, seventh or eighth. Let's see, I got the uh, I got the tankathon dot com. We're ninth right now. No, we're ninth. We're ninth right now because we passed that the island. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Didn't they trade for Eberle? <laughs> That's right. And we That's gave right. a Barzell for peanuts. Cue so the, cue and the Chirelli haters right now. <laughs> I thought Brandon hey. Davidson was supposed to put them over the top. Although they. Um, Let's be honest, though they uh, they love um, Alberta teams, right? Because <laughs> they they will now have uh, it would be something if they got uh, Dolan from that pick. I would laugh uh, so hard. Um, I and if anybody's going to get Dolan and it's not Edmonton, we hope that he goes out east. Well, <laughs> I'm hoping he goes to Detroit. Go to Detroit. The next Nicholas Lidstrom. I can go to Detroit games. <laughs> that that would be perfect. Didn't um, didn't Brian Burke lose this bet one time before? Oh, Burke. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Boston fans might be all over that. Toronto fans yeah. might be a little angry. Um, but yeah, the, the Edmonton's mm-hmm. sitting at ninth. And if we run the tankathon.com simulator right now, we would have the Oilers staying in ninth, but Dallas would jump up to first 12 spots. That's funny because I just ran it and Edmonton got second and selected Svechnikov and Connor McDavid got 130, <laughs> po- Connor McDavid got 130 points next year. <laughs> yeah, no, like I did it the other day and I think... Uh, the Islanders got the first two picks in the draft. So I That's just crazy. ran it, and unfortunately, we're sitting in 11th. That's horrible. I can't have that. I, I better run it one more time. All right. <laughs> 10, 10, 10,000 times, first. and you get a nice statistical yeah. Yeah, view exactly. of it. So. But, like, the re- yeah, realistically, that's the Oilers are going to be right in that range there, from like uh, probably seven to twelve, something like that. So, the pick they're going to get, I wouldn't be surprised if they dealt it. Yeah, well, you know, it's a deep draft, though, right? I mean, it uh, it depends. Um, at least the top top draft. They picks, could get a anyway. good. They could get a good D man there, probably, but. Or maybe if they're lucky, a guy like Faraby would drop in there. Um, but like, uh, you kind of you really want him to be up there in that top seven to get a to real real impact impact guy. Um, even the higher end defensemen like uh, Bouchard or Do- Dobson, uh, Hughes will be up there. Bolkvist will be up there. Wallstrom will be up there. So after that, you're looking at, uh, you know, guys like Lundestrom and, uh, 
Let me see if I can bring up the, the list here. Lundestrom and uh, Kupari or Kotkaniemi from Finland. Yeah. Uh, Ty Smith, maybe. I You know, there's a... Uh, you've been watching Spokane all year. Maybe Ty Smith is on their, their radar a little bit. And maybe Joe Valeno. It's what, you know. So. But, like, if there's... There's one way to get rid of a bad contract, and it's it's dealing him away with your first round pick, and that'd open up some cap room if if that was a uh, an option for the Oilers. Well, we're talking about uh, you know prospects in the draft. Uh, what's your thought? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, has been made of Bouchard moving up uh, the list lately. What's your thought on that, uh, Sean? Um, uh, if you're referring to the Craig Button article, then yeah, I mean, he moved him up to number five for me personally. I don't think he should be number five. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to say nobody's watched Bouchard more than I have. Um, I like his game. I think he's the thing with him is he's so mature. He's so poised with the puck. Um, I almost feel like he's already kind of peaked. Like there's no real upside with him because he plays years above his age. Right. Um, he, he's, he's basically a man amongst boys in the OHL, but come the NHL, if he's not, if there's no real upside, I feel like he's just going to kind of flatline a little bit. Um, whereas a guy like Noah Dobson just seems like he's got a higher ceiling. He's a little bit raw. Um, I, to be honest, I think, and I, you know, I'm a big London Knights fan, but I, I think Bouchard is a little overrated. Um, he, I mean, he does remind me of John Carlson he used to play for the Knights before he's got that offensive, um, upside to him, but defensively he does struggle a bit. He's not a physical player. Um, so I think, I think, would you take him or Merkley? Oh, I mean, you've seen both of them. Well, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, Merkley is Merkley's going to be a bust. Like I don't think Merkley is going to. Oh, yeah. I don't think he's going to be a good NHL player at all because his his defense is horrible. But if you just compare the right, he's a right-handed shot. Uh, Bouchard and Dobson's a right-handed shot as well. I think Dobson has the bigger upside. Um, and then I think I would actually take Ty Smith over Bouchard as well. Um, because I, I, I just like how I like his skating and I like his, you know, his intelligence, whatever. So Bouchard, I think at number five, I think that's way too high. And again, I wouldn't buy too much into Craig Button's rankings per se. Um, yeah. and you, be, you better hope there's no, uh, Knights fans listening to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever. Hey, I was so pro Robert Thomas last year for the Knights, and look, everybody's saying they do a redraft and he'd be top 10 for sure. And I was preaching he was top 10 last year. So I try and keep it real as much as I can. <laughs> any, um, any thoughts, Kelly, uh, going into the, um, I mean, we're not far away. What, what, uh, we're not far away from the lottery. What's your thoughts on, um, who might be uh, who might be changing or trending one way or the other? I mean, I'm I'm still kind of. I I think the biggest question for me is Kachuk, and you guys know I'm a big Kachuk fan. But biggest question in my mind is where does he go? You know, could he go up as high as second, or does he? Uh, you know, is there something these guys are uh, know about him, and he and he falls out of the um, top four, top five. Uh, and, uh, you know, and obviously depending on who gets picked in that one, two, three spot will, will have some bearing on that as well. I think the only one we can be certain of though is Dolan. I, I've had, I've heard a lot of people talking about Zadina over Svechnikov, but I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of side you, both of you. I mean, we had this discussion back on the uh, prospect episode, uh, the Q being the more, um, uh, you know, uh, finesse type of league, uh, I think fits uh, Zadina's game and maybe highlights him a little bit more than Svechnikov. But, um, you know, I think Svechnikov should probably go, go number two is my, is my thought. Kelly, any thoughts on, in terms of uh, what's trending or anything? Yeah. I just like recently started talking to a guy who's pretty, pretty close to the Canucks organization. And I asked him what their, 
what their plans are there. And he said, they'll, they're pretty high on Kachuk wherever they land, you know, apart from, apart from number one, right. Said, even if they landed number two, they'd probably take Kachuk there. Cause they, <clears throat> they got shit on so much for not taking his brother when, instead of taking, um, uh, Levy, right. And they're not, and they're not sure how you Levy is going to turn out either. He's got some, uh, uh, work ethic issues that he's trying to iron out in Finland. Right. Um, so he could, if Vancouver jumps into the top three, you know, Kajak could be, could be, uh, taken, taken right up there. And I think, I think it'll be Svechnikov over Zidane. It's been, it's been too long that he's kind of been the consensus number two. And Zidane is kind of coming on stronger as the season goes. And from my understanding is Svechnikov got suspended recently for a hit to the head so he hasn't hasn't even played any playoff games yet um whereas Zidane is playing for Halifax right yeah that's right um let's talk like yeah Bouchard's high I think from what I've read and heard he's uh he does all things well but nothing amazing um so he's a solid pick he's a safe pick per se. Whereas like, um, you know, Boakvist and, and Hughes, you're going to be, you're going to be dealing with their defensive issues, you know, and their, and their size. Um, and Bouchard's probably could s- step in a little earlier than, than those other two as well. Um, I wonder if Wallstrom kind of, hops into that top five because he seems to be the uh the top sniper in the in the draft just from a pure shooting perspective um and i like i think i think Faraby might drop a little bit but that's he's a little he's a little guy he's slight but he's got lots of character and he scores he's on a line with um he plays on a line with Jack Hughes and Oliver Wallstrom for the U.S. Uh, development team, and that that line is like destroying their opposition this year. Yeah, um, they should. Jack Hughes is uh, going to be the number one next year. Yeah, he's the next Patrick yeah. Kane. Um, you know what? I, I still have a little bit of interest in Barrett Hayton from Sault Ste. Marie. He peaks. He peaks. Peaks my interest a little bit. Just from an overall like your kind of pure hockey player throwback a little bit responsible defensively um i'd like to i'd like to dig into him a little more and see what's see what's the deal there uh but in terms of uh, hey sean how is sarah noel like they say he's kind of like the the next wayne simmons is that is there a comparative there um well, I don't know if they're saying that because he's black, but I mean, he's, he, I mean, he's, he's a power forward for sure. He's got the skating I mean, and he's definitely aggressive for sure. I mean, he's the one that, that lit up Maxim off there and he must've had about 10 hits the last game. Um, I, I guess there, yeah, I guess there is similarities. He's one of the biggest guys in the OHL. He kind of dominates really, um, you know, I don't, I don't see him. He's more of a, it's funny because he's more, even though he's a big guy, he's more of a speed guy. Like they did yeah, the skills mm. competition. And I think he was top three or top five in speed, uh, skating with the puck forward. So, I mean, he's definitely got speed. He kind of plays more of an outside game. He's not as much of a crush the net kind of player as you think he would be as, as when Wayne Simmons is, but I'm sure he could develop that part of it. But yeah, I mean, there's, mm. I could see definitely, you know, similarities between the two for sure. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was just, I heard that compared. I ever wanted to know if it was, uh, if it was accurate or not. Yeah. Sometimes guys like that, right? They go oh, later on in the draft, but they're the ones that are, um, you know, they're, it's not really much of a chance to take them because, you know, they, they look like they can be NHL style players, right? Like he might, uh, you know, he might go later on in the first round, but, um, you know, he's a big guy and, and is likely to play some games later on. Um, whereas you, you take some chances on some of these skilled players, right? Going in the top 10 that they, you know, can translate that into the, 
into the league. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you think about like, so the Oilers, as of right now, the Oilers are drafted ninth. So let's assume they don't get a lottery pick. It's possible that somebody behind them jumps in the top three and maybe they pick 10th. If you're the Oilers pick in 10th, what do you do? Do you, are you, are you looking for a defenseman for the future? Because there's nobody at number 10 that's going to jump in and play on this team next year or even in a year from now. So if you're looking for a power play quarterback, it's not going to be from the draft. And if you're looking for an impact forward, your Wallstrom's not going to be there and the top five's gone. So if let's say you've got the ninth or 10th pick, what do you do if you're Edmonton? Do you trade that for somebody else that can come in and have an impact and you got to consider the salary as well? Or do you move down in the draft, maybe package a Sakura and, and, and trade down with Vegas, for example? And uh, because, I mean, this draft is so deep, you could still get an impact player at number 20 or 25 or whatever it is. If you're the Oilers picking at ninth or 10th, what would you do? You know, you you bring up what is a good point, right? I mean, as you have that option then of maybe trading down and getting rid of a contract that you can't otherwise get rid of, right? For somebody who needs that pick or wants that pick bad enough. Um, you know, not not to say that, I mean, I, 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 I want to believe that Sekera can come back and play the kind of game we think he can play, but I, I, I'm quite worried about that contract. That's one I would trade away if I could. Uh, so if that option was made available to trade down, if you're sitting at that 10th, 10th spot, ninth, 10th spot, depending. And I think the Oilers, uh, you know, where are they on the overall right now? They're, um, if you go league wide, uh, you know, they're a point behind, um, a point behind the uh, Rangers right now and four points behind Carolina. Uh, I think the Oilers are going to have a hell of a, you know, seven games here. Um, I think they're going to finish even higher than, than where they're at right now. Um, you know, I think we'll have, we'll probably finish ahead of the Rangers and uh, we could potentially catch up to Carolina. And uh, if there's a God in this world, the Calgary Flames will lose every remaining game <laughs> of the season. Um, so we could pass them. Um, <laughs> they're already uh, they're already on five in a row. Let's keep it going. Um, Don't stop now. So, <laughs> you know, what's another, another six, right? Yeah, eleven in a row. Um, yeah, <laughs> they, they uh, it's been enjoyable uh, listening to after hours radio um, after the Calgary Flames games here. So anyway, so I mean, we you know you you bring up a great point, Sean. I mean, you got a chance to uh, in a deep draft trade down, potentially um, offload a, a contract uh, with that um, pick. Um, my biggest concern, and, and we haven't talked about Shirelli really this episode, which is kind of nice to be fair, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. My, um, I know you guys and, and, uh, and I'm kind of along the, with you, I'd like to see Shirelli back. I would just, uh, I don't think he's much of a shrewd mover in terms of trades. I know, you know, the Larson thing, we talked about that earlier. Um, my feeling uh, on him is he's not he's not a strong negotiator, and uh, and I don't think he you know he negotiates trades very well. I think from a um, just a hockey sense, uh, he's a smart guy. I think he um, you know he with the personnel that he's given, I think he makes some good moves. He's got uh, you know the scouting. He seems to tra- or to draft well. Uh, so I trust him in that department. Um, my concern in that environment would be, would he find the right deal uh, to move down? You know, would he think, you know, s- similar to what you said, you know, the smart thing to do would be to try to package a, a contract, move down and, and get a player that can play, you know, right away. Um, but is is that a Shirelli type of move? I don't know that it is. Uh, I'm not on board for letting him go I'd, I'd much rather i much think that the this season is um squarely on the shoulders of uh, of uh, mcclellan but um 
you know, I, I don't, I don't have a ton of trust in the shrewdness of, um, Chirelli's trades. I think he's made in, in a pinch, he's made some half decent trades. You know, there's, he can't be faulted for everyone that he's made, but, um, you know, I, I just don't think he's a great negotiator. I, yeah. That's my, that's my kind of feeling on it anyway. I don't, I don't really have a question for you guys. To <laughs> comment, but if you want to comment. Yeah, yeah, but if you, if you want to comment the, the on it, s- feel the free. I mean, he he yeah, ahead, knows what he wants and he's willing to overpay for it, be that a uh, a smart move or not. Um, he he gets he gets what he wants, right? So, but for the like every year, I think because I don't know if I was asking both you guys or or whatever before, but every year that he's. Um, He's been in charge in Edmonton. He's he's been uh, trying to swing deals at the draft in the first round. I think maybe last year with Yamamoto was the was the year um, that maybe he wasn't quite as active. But we remember like the wasn't the Hall Subban rumor was at the was at the draft, and then there was the um, Nugent Hopkins Dumba rumor at the draft. And then uh, I thought there was a three-way with uh, mm, Montreal and another team at the Pugliarvi draft because somebody wanted to hop up and take one of those guys in the top five. So he's not... Calgary and Columbus. Yeah. So he's, yeah. Not, he's not afraid to, to, you know, get talks going with his first-round pick. Um, depending on... Uh, or, like, just, just in, that, in that first round of the draft, actually. Uh, whether his first rounders in play is another uh is another story like like w- the scenario we were talking about earlier was if the Oilers just kind of stuck where they were or moved down the draft maybe to like n- number 10 or 12 the rangers have the n- have three first round draft picks uh this this upcoming draft and at the moment they're at number 10 i believe number 29 and number 30 would the rangers be willing to package those latter two for the oilers uh first rounder and you know the you know, oilers jump back and they pick a maybe a akil thomas out of niagara or uh maybe dominic bach is available or something like that, or Andre miller or something um just to just to move down and and get more first round pro- prospects to to facilitate this uh, rebuilding of the of the pipeline a little bit. Yeah, the Rangers have a sick uh, load of uh, picks uh, between uh, this year. They've got um, mm-hmm. well, they're being set up to trade two the, picks and move up. Rounds. If they have the tenth pick and the Oilers have the ninth pick, they could get back to back picks, right? So. There'd definitely be incentive to do that and, for sure. And they can move up even higher from there too. Right? Yeah. So they're gonna be uh if they play their cards right though, they're gonna be a sick team in two years, two, three years. Like they could be um you know, if they draft well and and uh you know, develop well. That that amount of picks and, and some shrewd moves, they could be um you know, we could be seeing the making of something here. Uh, you don't often get, uh, you know, seven in the top three. I think Vegas had how many picks did they have in the top in the first round last six year? Six in but, the uh, top two rounds, didn't they? Yeah, three in the first round. Weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no way Seattle's getting insane. that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you got to figure they'll fix that uh, somehow. Can I speak to about Shirelli for a second there, Mike? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so about that. Well, just just my opinion of Shirelli, and I, I think it's funny. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the guy takes a lot of heat, and we're talking about this season, how, you know, who's to blame? And I see a lot of people still have their, their nice, cute little fire Shirelli hashtag and that, but, I mean, it's no secret, obviously. I've been a Shirelli fan pretty much from the beginning, but, I mean, you got to look at things realistically and you got to look at what we had before he got here and the drafts before Shirelli got here were, were God awful. And his drafts since he got here have been absolutely fantastic. And 
you know, for, for a salary cap team moving forward, which is what the Oilers are, it is imperative we have year after year guys on entry level contracts coming in, making the NHL or whatever. Um, you know, we've seen it with, you know, Pulley Arvey's with the team this year. Yamamoto hopefully will be either with the team or in the AHL. Benson will be in the AHL. We've got Maximoff coming and all these guys overseas coming in the, in the American, uh, U S hockey league. You know, it, it just kills me how people, <laughs> how people want to roast the GM over a couple of trades saying, you know, he's garbage. Let's get rid of him. Fire Shirelli you got to look at the big picture and, you know, and now that this whole Hall and Larson thing came out, obviously, you know, he got what he could in the Hall trade. He got, and he got a top pair defenseman for it and a guy that's a big impact. And even the Eberle for Strom trade, like it, it drives me crazy. People just, they lose their mind. We, you know, we would have been so much better if we would have kept Eberle. Why did we trade Eberle? Well, Strom pretty much has the same points as Eberle did last year for the Oilers. So we literally lost nothing in trading Eberle for Strom, but we gained like $3 million in salary for the next couple of years. Like, you know, it, it, it just, it blows my mind. People don't look at the big picture. And if you compare to Shirelli what we had before, I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. Like, obviously, he's doing a good job. And, you know, I mean, the guys won a Stanley Cup. He built huge, hugely successful teams in Boston. And, you know, if you just look at Boston, the last draft Boston had before he got fired, they drafted Pasternak in the first round with the 25th yeah. overall pick. They drafted Ryan Donato in the second round. He's just paying dividends now for Boston. They drafted Danton Heinen, who was just a rookie this year. They drafted Andrews Bjork, who's in the minors, who's got a promising career. And even their seventh round pick is playing in Providence. It takes time for these guys to develop. And clearly Shirelli's had a good draft. He's had good drafts since he's been here. He's built a foundation. I don't understand what you know what what fans what else fans want because he made one or two trades that they don't like they want to can his ass well he's he's doing so much for this organization you know he's fixed the leftorium and everything else why would you want to get rid of that guy and start over with somebody else when if you just take a step back off the ledge and just set your motions aside for a second from the hall trade which we now see makes a lot more sense He's doing so much good for this team, for this organization. He's building a foundation. Why in God's name would you ever want to let him go? And 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 to blame him for this season, I think we now see that the coach dropped the ball on this. His power play sucks. His penalty kill sucks. He's screwing around. Slept chef, pulley, Harvey, dry sidle, won't put Hopkins with McDavid, whatever. Um, and how much of that? Uh, you know, how much of that is Shirelli's fault? I don't think it's much. I think there's a big disconnect between the two. But why would you ever want to let go of a GM like this? We're never gonna we're never gonna hire another GM with his credentials and with his drafting history. So why 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 are you so active and so adamant about running him out of town? We're never gonna find a better GM than this guy. So just give it a rest and just let our draft picks play out. Let the farm system, let the you know, the guys he's drafted, let them get to Bakersfield. We're starting to see Caleb Jones and Ethan Bear, and we're going to see some more guys. Let them play out. Just relax a little bit. You know, there's the foundation. It's coming. Don't freak out. Don't overreact. It's there. He's a good GM. He knows what he's doing. Why are you freaking out? That's that's all I have to say to Oilers fans. <laughs> so you were talking a little too fast there, though, Sean. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, just it is two forty-five in the morning here <laughs> for everybody <laughs> listening. If you're still tuned in, so yeah, yeah. If I may or may not that's the right time to say it. Now you can you can say why well, I did say it, but uh, it yeah, was exactly. late. In the episode. Nobody's listening, but whatever. <laughs> no, you know what? You're uh, you're a hundred percent right. I uh, I couldn't agree more. In fact, as the season has gone on. Yeah. I think it's become brutally aware that it's not Chirelli that's the problem. Uh, and I think the three of us here um, all agree with that. But it's not uh, its not popular uh, to say that. Um, he's been target number one. 
So, you know, it's, um, but it's, uh, it's just been, you know, it's been so brutally obvious, uh, over the past month, what, uh, what could have, you know, what could have been this season that we didn't see. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this team is, um, this is the same team we had at the beginning of the year. In fact, this, uh, this personnel, uh, you know, say what you will, this is what we had at the beginning of the year. Nobody, uh, in fact, we're short a guy that, um, you know, in Patrick Maroon, but, uh, we had these guys in the system. It uh, Shirelli, uh, was the one that if, if you're a fan of Ty Ratty or not, he's the one that brought him in for depth on the, um, in the AHL. Uh, he'll, and he's probably the one that's going to sign him again for, you know, another go round. Uh, and, uh, that's depth that's proven to, um, you know, it's, it looks like good depth for us to have, uh, that possibility there and that those kind of players there. So if, you know, if we're going to do anything to keep that strategy, I even, um, you know, uh, he listened to, uh, we all listened to Stoffer on Oilers. Now he, um, he talked about it just, uh, Friday, I think, which was, you know, the, it's not popular right now, but don't make too many moves in the off season. Right. Um, you know, there's not, it's not a lot to screw around with right now. We got a strategy. Let's, uh, let's use it. Let's develop some of these players and let's, um, you know, I, when, when I had Sean on and, and, uh, you know, some of these guys, uh, uh, Marcus sport major. I mean, we talked about this is there's a need for sure for a little bit of patience with our development system and with the strategy that's happening right now. And, and, um, you're right. These, these draft picks, uh, you can't not be excited about what Yamamoto is going to bring to this team when he's ready to play in the NHL. You know, um, we've already seen him. He had some bad bounces when he was uh, nine games in, you mm-hmm. know, he, uh, he, he shouldn't have been playing, but he was, and he didn't look completely out of place. Um, so when he's ready to play, uh, he'll look good. When Ethan Bear's ready to play, he'll be good. When, when Jones is ready to play, he'll be good. Uh, Maximov, um, I, I, I'm not as familiar with Safin, but um, I assume he's, you know, he's not uh, not terrible, but it'll be a nice addition to the to the farm team at the very least, right? So, yeah. So I think, um, you know what, guys, it's uh, it's getting late, and um, you know, I you gave me a chance to say my last word. <laughs> Any last thoughts, uh, uh, Kelly or, or Sean, uh, before we uh, end for the evening? Or, or in your case, Kelly, the afternoon. The afternoon, yeah, it's three o'clock. It's time to go out for uh, for shopping. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I don't think so. I think you know, you and Sean really kind of summed up the year in a tidy fashion. Um, I think you know we have an an interesting off season to look forward to, um, and if Chirelli is smart <laughs> uh, he won't he won't blow it up like some are uh, expecting him to do he'll he'll leave clef bomb and nugent hopkins alone and he'll go into next season with that with that roster intact and maybe you know add a complimentary player or or drop someone that's underperforming um but i'm i'm looking forward for the off season um and i and i hope i hope he does the uh, hope he does the right things i think next year everyone is gonna bounce back because you know we heard that's what they were supposed to, that's what eberle was supposed to do and he did it this year right and um there's no reason that the guys like lucic and kazian and and clef bomb there's no reason that they can't uh go back to what they were uh uh, last season and i think with talbot going into a contract year we're gonna see the talbot that we're actually seeing now and go into next year and we're gonna be in the playoffs next year i i, I really i really believe that and a lot of people and it's gonna be with chiarelli at the helm and i'm gonna be where i'm gonna be there with my all hail chiarelli flag <laughs> you know 
praising his uh, praising his moves or his non moves, if you will, and uh, and it's going to be a beauty. Yeah, I uh, I think you're right. I think, uh, and you know what? Uh, in this quick uh, before we close it off, but um, a good example is L.A. tonight, and they brought up Kopitar's numbers from last year. Uh, and the bounce back that he's had and and uh, really a lot of the guys for LA um, you know playing to their expectation I think this is an anomaly year for us uh, I'm I'm pretty excited just seeing this team in the last couple games uh, for what's going to happen next year and I always bring back I've, I've said this now I'm on episode 22 but probably 21 episodes I've been saying this is the personnel that all the experts said would win the cup or, or be there at the end. Um, that's not changed. So I, you know, I hope we don't make too many moves uh, in the off season and I hope we uh, hope we win uh, one of the top three picks. That'd be great. Sean, any uh, last comments before uh, you kick it off? It's uh, late there. It's almost three o'clock in uh, London right now. <laughs> well, I agree with you. If you're still still yeah, awake, I'm an idolic, anyways. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, and you know, this year it's it's funny. Sometimes you need to take one step back in order to take two steps forward. And I think it's been a learning year. It's been it's been a tough year, but I think the guys have have learned a lot. And uh, you know, they've kind of got some hard knocks, and it'll help them in the future. I, I think it's become perfectly clear that the coaching staff needs to be replaced, and I think they will. Um, you know, McClellan's never won any won anything in the NHL before, and I, I think it's time to find somebody that can, and hopefully Quinville's that guy. But I agree with you guys that I don't think there's there's much to be uh, – we don't need to replace much here. I think the, the core is already set long-term. We've got a good top pair. We've got, you know, guys for the future. We've got prospects coming. We've got right D. We've got everything that we need. Just need a few tweaks. We've got the right GM in place who knows what he's doing, despite what fans think. And, uh, you know, get the right coach in here. The guys respond the way they should. And I think they're, as much as this year sucked, and keep in mind Calgary didn't make the playoffs either, as much as this year sucked, I think in the long run, Edmonton's going to be better for it. So go Oilers, and I, I'm looking forward to um, hopefully a Stanley Cup year next year. Awesome. All right. Have a great night, guys, and thanks for joining the show. Thanks, Mike. Take care.